it was a sort of brave new world in a way. We were the first people to do it, and um, now everybody's out there using the satellites. But we were the first. Satellite technology is a tremendous instrument for freedom and for democracy. Nobody can stop satellites. This is the most wonderful thing. Well, together with the growth of computers and telephones, satellite broadcasting is the most important single advance since Caxton invented the printing press. You don't want to fight the next war with the last war's weapons, you know, and, and tactics. You want to go into the next war, and I'm against war, but business is war. Mike Fitzpatrick was one of the first people in Britain to own a satellite dish. Now he's making sure he has the freedom to choose channels from all over the world. This is my window in the world, my satellite dish. It's currently pointing at a satellite above the Indian Ocean. It's at 63 degrees east of south. On that satellite you get channels from Iran and Italy. And as I motor it around, we're now going past some satellites which carry Russian television, Arabian satellites, German satellite, Turkish satellites. The first thing I do when I get home at night is uh, make myself a cup of coffee. And I sit down, grab my satellite remote, and look and see what's new. And it's uh, quite tremendous to think that you're sitting here in Britain watching a channel, there's somebody over in Crete, or in Egypt, or Tunisia, or South Africa, or in Moscow, is also watching. On top of all these channels, which are uh, virtually full-time transmissions, you also get occasional transmissions of two or three hours a night, or maybe only two or three hours a week. And things like Vatican TV is a good example of that. Um, I'm not quite sure what language the Pope's speaking in today. I used to work in Norway, and in Norway they, have one, they had only one channel at that time. And it was eight o'clock. And the main program of the evening was how to grill fish. At that point, I think I cracked. I had enough. And uh, I resolved there and then I was going to get a satellite dish. I wanted choice. The desire for choice is making satellite television an immense and highly competitive global business. But satellite is also causing fierce political debate. Some argue that it extends freedom and democracy. Others fear that it will ravage the world's diverse cultures, threaten national sovereignty, and undermine traditional broadcasting. What is certain is that satellites are changing the world at breathtaking speed. It's 50 years since satellite broadcasting was first envisaged by the then unknown writer Arthur C. Clarke. In 1945, I was in the Air Force, and I conceived the idea of using satellites as relay stations out in space, far enough away from the Earth for a single satellite to beam programs to half the planet. And I knew that at a certain distance from the Earth, the satellite would take exactly 24 hours to go around the Earth, and therefore it would appear to be fixed in the sky, the concept of the geosynchronous or stationary orbit. That was the obvious place to put such a satellite, so I just wrote this up in a short paper, and that was that. Twenty years later, Clark's vision began to take form. In 1962, the first international communication satellite was launched, Telstar. In a very few minutes, you're going to see those pictures that are on the monitors now, transmitted live across the Atlantic, 3,000 miles. No tape, no recording. Everything's happening as you see it happening. My name's Richard Dimbleby. I'm talking to you at the moment from the control room of Eurovision in Brussels. 
Hello, America. Are you receiving our pictures from Europe, please? We now have Big Ben on our monitors here, Mr. Dumbleby. So, go. Europe, go. Hello, North America. July the 23rd, 1962. This is your first view of our continent, live as you watch it at this moment. There, in the foreground, a London policeman talks to, I'm told, American visitors in London. Big Ben in the background, the policewoman in her familiar uniform at his side. Ladies and gentlemen, we have just been informed that this baseball game is being seen in Europe right now over the Telstar satellite. Let's give all the baseball fans in Europe a big hello from Chicago. And that part of today's press conference is being relayed by the Telestar communications satellite to viewers across the Atlantic. And uh, this is another indication of the extraordinary world in which we live. And I think this understanding which will inevitably come from the speedier communications is bound to uh, increase uh, the well-being and the uh, security of all people. That was an experiment which demonstrated satellites' potential. But it was another 15 years before satellites could be relied on for regular television broadcasting. In 1976, Ted Turner began to distribute his local TV channel from Atlanta through cable networks across America. We stress entertainment more than we do information here. We feel like that the other networks in America do enough to depress everybody. We try and cheer everybody up. Everybody's scared over here now, and uh, everybody else is always telling us that gold's going up and the stock market's going down and the floods and earthquakes and everything, and uh, we show the Beverly Hillbillies and let them forget about it for a minute. What would happen if all the other stations decided to stop showing the news and show the Beverly Hillbillies? Because then I'd put on the news, you dummy. That's why England's in so much trouble. Nobody's got any brains over there anymore. But there were more brains in Britain than Turner thought, and his idea was soon copied here. In 1982, Sally Harrison presented Europe's first ever satellite TV program. In those days, Sally and Amanda Cuthbert were colleagues. They were part of a small, adventurous group who became the first broadcasters of the new satellite era. How long ago was it? Can you remember? It was April 1982, wasn't it? So it is nearly 13 years ago, yeah. Seems like yesterday. <laughs> they do for you, it doesn't do for me. <laughs> oh, it was, it was very exciting, and we were all new to it. Well, we were starting a brand new broadcasting service, a brand new way of transmitting television programs. And that night was the first night of, of the revolution, if you like. Well, we're changing the face of broadcasting. Well, we were the pioneers, the weren't we? Together, they hosted the first night of satellite broadcasting in Europe. I think we started in, in English, didn't we? Yes, so, yes. It's a good, good evening and welcome to satellite television. And then... And then because we were going out to Norway and Finland, we spoke in Norwegian and Finnish. So I said, Velkommen uh, Norska Sierra. And I and said then, something like, Terve, Tervelis, what well, I said, or something. And then right. we must have both and then said, said and, Welcome, Welcome to, to Europe's first satellite television. Good evening. Good afternoon. Welcome to Nushka Sierra. Terve. Tele. Swamalaiset. In Selimkom. Bonsoir. Good abend. Good evening. I'm Amanda. And I'm Sally. And we'd like to welcome you to Satellite Television's first evening of programming. Coming to you by satellite from the heart of London. We start our program... Well, that's today. how it's our first ever satellite television day. service looked in April when we started but we've been uh, looking into how to do satellites for about four years. 
uh, I went to America and discovered that there were already perhaps 20 or 30 satellite and cable channels that far back. And as they're the same number of frequencies over Europe, I thought perhaps there's the same number possible here. And I discovered that indeed there were. I thought, well, let's see how we can make it work. Brian Haynes managed to buy time on a telecommunication satellite for 300 pounds an hour. He tried to persuade the company he was working for, Thames Television, to back his experiment. They refused. So he left and raised four million pounds to go it alone. His team set up in a little studio off Carnaby Street. Programs were broadcast by satellite to regional centers and then carried on cable to people's homes. But the company had to fight hard to get on air. The satellites were owned by European telephone companies who tried to deny them access. The satellite TV service broke all of the rules. The satellites that we had operating across Europe at that time had been, been designed for telephone calls between European countries. Then we had this, this bunch of people, uh, free thinking, um, entrepreneurs come forward with this apparently crazy idea to use those satellites to transmit TV programs. Good evening, welcome to Monday night's viewing. Welcome to Monday's viewing, then. In those days, it was illegal to receive satellite transmissions in all European countries, including Britain. But Brian Haynes finally managed to persuade Norway and Finland to cooperate, and others followed. energy from the satellite falls down over the whole of Europe, all the way from North Africa, right, right over Russia, all the way up to the Arctic Circle. And on the yellow pins, which we've got here in Helsinki, uh, here in Oslo, and down here in Zurich, all together there's about a third of a million homes connected and able to watch tonight, and of course it's growing slowly all the time. But the technology was untried and the staff often had great difficulty even finding the satellite in the sky. Every night was a new challenge because as we were broadcasting on a test satellite, which was actually quite old and could be unreliable, we were on a knife edge on many occasions um, wondering when and if we would actually get on air. On one particular occasion, um, we had just begun transmissions and we lost the uh, signal from the satellite when we uh, spoke to British Telecom, it proved that a repeater station between London and Martlesham had in fact got a fault. And the only way that this could be fixed, because it was an unmanned station, was that the duty engineer had to go out on his bike a number of miles to a hilltop to fix it before we could continue broadcasting. It was the first time anybody had put together a pan-European type of programming. So we were thinking, obviously, very much how channels worked here but we had to think well you know the Europeans are watching this so we've got to get comedy visual things um, and I do remember that I think it was a documentary um, where basically these elephants were kicking this ball about as well as buying cheap programming from abroad they showed British golden oldies but after a year the money ran out and the company's backers lost confidence. Then a media mogul began to take an interest. We were looking for more investment in the company. And then two journalists turned up one day and had a snoop around, Australian journalists, uh, which uh, later on we discovered were Murdoch's men on the ground sniffing the, the place out. Clearly, we, we, we were anxious not to reveal our identities because <clears throat> obviously our company had a, a, a high profile in media. And, and this was such an experimental environment. We didn't want to get too many people too excited about our interest. So it's true that we, I wouldn't use the word undercover, but we were working pretty hard not to reveal our identities. Their report was persuasive. In 1983, Rupert Murdoch, already the owner of Britain's News of the World, Sun, Times and Sunday Times, decided to buy Satellite TV Limited. He changed its name to Sky Channel. We tried very hard to keep it British. We tried very hard not to sell it to, to Murdoch. Uh, but in the end, his pockets were the deepest. 
and after we'd sold it, we were summoned to his office in Gray's Inn Road. Split-level office. We sat on the lower level in our big bungee sofa. He sat at his desk, considerably higher than us, and just said, well, what have I bought? He was looking at the programming schedule, and he saw the movies and the cartoons, and then he picked on a title which was called Window on the World, and he said to me, what's this particular series about and I said well I've bought a series of documentaries and he stopped me and he said ah I know what you've done you've bought a load of crap and given it a good title and I thought oh god you know this is a good start then he laughed and he said don't worry we do exactly the same in Australia The government had changed the law, so satellite television could now be received in Britain. But it was only available through cable, so the British audience for Sky was very small, about 10,000 homes in the test area of Swindon. I can remember in 1984 Rupert Murdoch saying to me, this thing is not going to be a business until you can deliver a satellite signal to a dish the size of that coffee table. And I can remember looking down at this coffee table and thinking, it's technically impossible. In Luxembourg, the impossible was beginning to happen. Candice Johnson, an American, brought a business proposition to the Luxembourg government. It was to revolutionize satellite television. She seized on Luxembourg's tradition of pirate broadcasting and persuaded the government to back a private satellite. The story began when she married the Luxembourg ambassador to Washington. I had visited, of course, Luxembourg before I married my husband because I had to be approved, which was a very funny thing. Um, I had to visit the prime minister and um, the foreign affairs minister because I was a foreigner who was marrying an ambassador while he was in service. And so my mother bought me a new suit and I flew to Luxembourg to, to be approved. Before I married my husband, I told him, I said, well, I will marry you, but I will keep my name my money and my career. And I wanted to be, however, I wanted to be a good ambassador's wife. I wanted to do something for Luxembourg, uh, but I wanted to do it my way. And so I thought, well, what could I do for Luxembourg? And I come from what I call a satellite family. Uh, my father was one of the first pioneers in satellite uh, communications. He was the uh, assistant head of the Office of Telecommunications Policy for the United States for President Kennedy for President Johnson. So uh, I thought that this was something that I could do for Luxembourg. And I wrote to the Prime Minister in June of 1982 and I said, well, you know, here I think this is why Luxembourg should have a private satellite and this is how you could do it. So then in February of 1983, a number of people, we worked and, and we got together an idea for Luxembourg to have a multinational private satellite. The European broadcasting bureaucracy was horrified. All the European governments were working on a master plan to regulate television satellites. So they were shocked when this new company, SES, announced that it was going to broadcast from a private telecommunications satellite that was outside their plan.
Now, everybody was against this. I mean, everybody. The, the, the monopoly PTTs, the Post and Telecommunication Companies, they didn't like this private satellite project because they ha all had their own uh, public satellite projects. The broadcasters, the state monopoly broadcasters, they didn't like this project either because this was going to infringe on their territory. It was going to let somebody else come into their playing field, and they didn't like it either. The main opposition uh, to SES came from the telephone companies and through their satellite organization, UTELSAT. They could not imagine that there could be a competitor privately driven which would do the same uh, job that they were thinking they should do. The new satellite was called Astra. Most telephone companies wanted to keep it out, but one was prepared to break ranks and team up with Astra. It was British Telecom. We were facing a set of prejudices. That we were resolute. We were, we were convinced that it was the right way for, um, for a successful telecommunications company to, um, um, to behave, and certainly a telecommunications company that wanted to continue to be successful into the future. So we stuck to our guns. Steve Main, who was their kind of head of uh, broadcasting, I believe, at that point, he said, OK, we are going to support this Astro satellite. And they supported us within these Eudelsat, Eudelsat Council meetings. And um, as a result, we got the Astro project through a lot of the barriers that we couldn't have gotten otherwise. Now, the interesting thing was that BT was a major partner in both Intelsat and Utelsat. And when it suddenly announced it had done a deal with this private sector operation called SES, or now known as Astra, uh, everyone sat up and said, what on earth is going on? Why is BT breaking rank with the other PTTs, with the other telecommunications operators internationally? What on earth is going on? Is there about to be a sea change in things? In the mid-1980s, Britain was still wedded to the official European plan for regulating satellites. In 1986, the Independent Broadcasting Authority invited bids for the license to be Britain's satellite broadcaster. One group has emerged which we believe contains the reality of the present with the vision of the future. The IBA has accordingly, this afternoon, offered the contract to British Satellite Broadcasting, BSB. BSB had won the prize, but it carried stringent technical conditions. BSB was not allowed to use the old PAL transmission system, but had to invest in a new high-quality system called DMAC. The IBA gave us to understand that um, DMAC was it and that PAL wasn't it. Uh, we pressed them on this very strongly. And I remember the IBA engineers explaining that the PAL signal was of a quality that would never be acceptable to people who saw off-air television in this country in all its glory, that the PAL signal would be so snowy and broken up and so on. They said if it rained, it would get worse. So we went and we, uh, we asked for a demonstration of what the PAL signal would look like compared with the DMAC, and we saw a demonstration, and of course the DMAC picture was absolutely superb, and the PAL picture was ghastly. Um, we were leery a bit about this, but we were told by the, the body that was offering the franchise, we had to use DMAC, so we planned for DMAC. The technical requirements, of course, were completely beyond me because I'm, 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 I couldn't even change it wheel on a car. Um, uh, but people spoke extremely well of them, and these were people that one, of course, rated. Uh, and I think that probably the most reassuring thing, I thought, was that at least these people had got together, I think it was 250 million pounds, and they weren't um, fly-by-nights. Uh, so I thought it was good enough for them, but probably good enough for me. BSB was required to build its own satellites. At the time, both the authorities and the broadcasters believed that only a high-powered television satellite could carry a clear signal to individual homes. In their view, the job could not be done by a medium-powered satellite like Astra. But in Luxembourg, they thought differently.
plans for Astra were already underway. Well, every company in uh, Luxembourg that is worth its salt has a uh, chateau. And so, you know, I'm American, and coming to Luxembourg, which has more than 100 chateaus, although many of them are in ruins, I said, well, it's very clear, we have to have a chateau for the satellite. We then drove around on a Saturday uh, in Luxembourg, and of course, you know, Luxembourg is not that large, so we could kind of go and visit all of the possible chateaus. And then we saw this one and it was in a protected uh, area, and uh, it was, of course, in a ruin, um, but it, it was possible that maybe we could get it. And then, of course, we decided that we would not put all of the technology into the chateau, that this would be primarily the offices, the administrative offices. And so then we had a technical facility, and the technical facility, the first one that we had, is actually this building that you see down there. The Astra dream could now become reality. Technical advances meant that signals from medium-powered satellites could be picked up on small dishes. Astra reception is as easy as ABC. For direct-to-home reception, all you need is a small fixed dish antenna of 60 centimeters or more, correctly aligned on the orbital position of the satellites. Rupert Murdoch saw the opportunity that Astra offered. His Sky Channel still only reached a few thousand cable homes in Britain. If Astra worked, he would be able to reach a mass audience. So he seized the chance. Well, it was just one of those risks we had to take. We were advised that it would work. Whereas the government wanted to impose a totally new and expensive satellite technology that would allow only five new channels whereas my vision was really to give the widest possible choice to the consumer uh, at the cheapest price. And of course, it was vital for us doing this to be on the air before everyone else. The contact with Mr. Murdoch was a breakthrough, and I think it was a breakthrough. I think it was important because Mr. Murdoch was so committed to satellite television. I mean, he came there and he said, OK, we are going to make a new world. Rupert Murdoch heralded the new world six months before Astra was actually launched. He would have to invest 1.8 billion pounds and risk his company to establish his new service. I'm happy to announce today that Sky will be leasing four transponders on this magnificent new uh, Astra satellite, which will base the company based in Luxembourg and which is due to be launched on November the 4th uh, of this year. It was a bolt from the blue. It was a surprise and not a very pleasant surprise. We then hoped, hoped that the IB en engineers were right and that the PAL signal would be unacceptable. BSB also hoped that Murdoch would be banned from breaking its satellite monopoly. In fact, by being on Astra, Murdoch had put himself beyond the reach of British broadcasting law. In reality, what happened was that the uh, Thatcher government of the mid-80s was uh, willing to allow Rupert Murdoch to come in with an alternative way of delivering satellite broadcasting to the people of the UK. Uh, and indeed, uh, some might even say that uh, uh, this shows that the person who uh, says boo to government regulators is the one who gets away and uh, does best out of it. Did you try to get the government to stop Murdoch at that stage? did an awful lot of talking uh, to the Home Office and indeed to the Prime Minister herself and, and to various, uh, to the government in, in, in any way we could. And what was Mrs Thatcher's view? Uh, I think that she thought we were rather wet. Well, I think the government, if it, if it had been so minded, could, could have introduced some legislation which would have covered uh, uh, a satellite service which was not of the kind envisaged in the original direct broadcast satellite, domestic broadcast satellite legislation. 
um, but it did not do so, and certainly we had no powers uh, to, uh, to uh, either to license uh, Sky or to prevent it uh, operating. Everybody in private thought this was all terrible, uh, but in public, that was not the case. They thought, in private, people thought what was terrible? Well, there's too much power going to murder was not a good thing. Uh, having television come into this country that was in no way controlled worried people. Uh, I think the Tory party felt uh, that Rupert was a useful ally. The Conservatives' opponents and some broadcasters argued that Murdoch was benefiting unduly from this relationship. But nothing was guaranteed. The risks were enormous. The launch of Astra was a tense occasion, and the first attempt had to be abandoned. I sat there in the control room, and I thought, my God, how could I have done this? And the next day, uh, we were uh, on an island near the uh, Kuru launch site, and it wasn't clear if the satellite was going to go up that night either. And I was really getting worried. <laughs> and then Mr. Dalest, the president of Ariane Espace, came, he gave me a kiss on two cheeks, and he said, Madame Johnson, on va lancer votre satellite ce soir. We will launch your satellite tonight. Not only does the future of our company, SES, depend on this successful launch, but also it affects the jobs and the lives of a great many of people. The atmosphere in the room was a very tense atmosphere. People didn't even dare to speak amongst themselves. And in the last moments, you almost heard the hard speed of each of the people waiting if it was successful or not. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Top. Allumage, premier étage. Décollage. crying then just like I did now. <laughs> uh, yeah. With the Astra satellite in place, Murdoch's new Sky Television service was ready to transmit. 15 seconds to go. Nine, eight, eight seven, seven, six, five, five four, four, three, three two, two, one, one go! go. <laughs> hey! Sky Television was able to deliver four channels direct to people's homes before BSB had even launched its satellite. This is Sky News. Ten Britons will sell their kidneys to this man. The new face of Moore's murderer, Myra Hindley, back in hospital this week. And the heart-lung mother says, happy birthday, son. And nobody complained about the picture quality. Alas, the IBA engineers were wrong. The PAL signal, as we all know, is perfectly acceptable. Once we knew that, we knew we had real competition on our hands, and we looked again at our projections, and they did not look nearly as good as they had done. But how could such a huge mistake have been made? Because uh, uh, at that time, nobody had actually tested in reality uh, just uh, how possible it would be to uh, deliver uh, PAL systems via a medium-powered satellite, which is what the Astra satellite uh, is and was, uh, into, the, into the home. I don't think it's surprising that the IBA and the Home Office at that time didn't recognise the potential from these new satellite systems that we saw. Um, they were custodians, in a sense, of, of the um, broadcast establishment. Um, they were custodians of broadcasting history rather than shepherds of broadcast's future. BSB recruited from the British television establishment and aimed to produce programmes in the public service tradition. But achieving the technical specifications laid down in the franchise, 
meant that they were late getting on air. This gave Sky a crucial head start. Well, everybody thought BSP had all the cards. They were the establishment choice with monopoly power and monopoly money. We approached the whole project in a completely different way. BSB preferred fine buildings and big cars, whereas we worked out of prefabs and spent the money on creating a market, selling the idea of television choice, really. The war between BSB and Sky was relentless and nearly destroyed them both. We were losing money very, very heavily. But the same was true of Rupert. He was losing money very, very heavily. And it, you know, it was a slow bicycle race. I don't know who was losing it quicker than the other one and who was going slower, not wanting to merge. But it was clear as can be that a merger must take place if the thing was going to be viable. Six months after BSB went on the air, Sky and BSB suddenly announced a merger. Joint deputy managing directors will be Sky's Gary Davy and BSB's Ian Club. The merger brings to an end a satellite war, with both parties claiming tonight there can no longer be a loser in the TV space race. The new company was called B Sky B and was owned equally by Sky and BSB shareholders. But to the outside world, it seemed like a Sky takeover. I've heard the word bloodbath used a lot. I mean, a lot of people tried to portray it as this terrible slashing that was going on, but it was a, it was a business reality, uh, and everyone knew it had to be done. There was, no, there was no painless way to deal with it. The Australians strode in. Uh, Rupert sat at my desk. Uh, there was that little chap I can't, who, who's done very well for them. He was sort of tore down all the non-smoking signs and got through his 60 a day and there was a sort of violation. It's wonderful. I mean, I, I, I do admire Rupert. I think, you know, you just clean out everybody and therefore there can be no sort of tribal warfare twittering on as that so often happens when you get murders. I mean, I think that we were killed to a man. So ended the first battle of the satellite wars. A lot of blood had been spilled, but the loser kept 50% of the spoils. The clash proved the importance of being first. Murdoch was first with the dish and the first to understand the potential of the Astra satellite. After his success, the other satellite broadcasters clambered aboard and Astra became the hot bird of Europe. But Europe was only the beginning. There was an even bigger market waiting on the other side of the world. Satellite Wars returns next Sunday at 9. And if you'd like to order a copy of the Channel 4 Who's News booklet, please send a cheque or postal order for £2, payable to Channel 4, to Who's News, PO Box 4000, London W3 6XJ.